He probably thought he was Jesus who could speak on and on and on, but no one minded. Well, today it's a little bit difficult, so we have to clap quite heavily when the time comes for him to stop. <laughs> but we'd like to welcome him. He's a brother, he's a friend, he's a real witness to the cause of Christ at the checkpoint. Tony, please. I was talking to my wife on the telephone last night. I, I said, it's, it's really going to be tough. Uh, there's 30 speakers ahead of me. Uh, it's the end of the week. Everybody's tired, worn out intellectually. Uh, when I get up to speak, I'm going to be nervous. And she said, when you get up to speak, God is going to be nervous. <laughs> it's been, uh, whatever has been learned uh, from the lectern, is nothing to be compared with the friendships that I have made. And a lot of you uh, knew me from the last time I was here. So many people came up and said, do you remember me? Do you remember me? And I don't, never know quite how to answer that. I, I had one woman come up and say, do you remember me? And in a moment of divine inspiration, I said, Madam, in order to get any work done, I had to put you out of my mind. <laughs> I had this neat speech worked out before I even came here, but as the week unfolded, one thing I was going to say after another was dealt with by other speakers more thoroughly, more brilliantly, in greater articulation than I ever could do. And so it's been hard. And I, 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 even last night, I was kind of scrambling around, uh, you know, trying to find something that hadn't been said. And, after a while, I felt like a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. You know, I, it was really hard. But uh, after talking to my wife, she said, well, you're a sociologist. Why don't you look at this whole thing sociologically? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the perceptions of this crisis and this conflict. Uh, as, as a red letter Christian sociologist, that term, red letter Christian, just came into play. A group of us got together in Washington, D.C. a while back, and we discussed a very important question. Could we use the word evangelical anymore? Please understand, our theology is as evangelical as ever. Uh, we hold to the doctrines of the Apostles' Creed. We believe that the scripture is divinely inspired and is an infallible guide for faith and practice. We, we believe that salvation comes by having a mystical encounter with the resurrected Jesus, wherein he invades our lives, transforms us, and makes us into new people. We believe these essential dimensions of what it means to be an evangelical, but the word evangelical has collected a lot of ugly baggage. When I go to speak at a place like Dartmouth College or Harvard University, and I say I'm an evangelical, the red flags go up. Immediately I am defined as, an, uh, as a Christian who is anti-women, anti-gay, pro-war, anti-Arab. It goes on and on and on. And, and I have to stand back and say that's not who I am. And I'm tired of trying to explain myself. And I think a lot of evangelicals who are not anti-women, anti-gay, anti-environment, anti-Arab, have a hard time explaining themselves. So a group of us sat together and said, can we come up with a new name? And uh, we got a new name from a secular Jewish country and Western disc jockey in Nashville, Tennessee, <laughs> who began to refer to us as red letter Christians. You know, the old Bibles have the words of Jesus in red letters. And so we said, that's it. We're gonna be red letter Christians. We're gonna take the red letters of the Bible seriously. Shane Claiborne, who was one of my students and comes out of Eastern, as I do, as Paul Alexander does, and as Ron Sider does. We, we control this system. <laughs> uh, but but uh, Shane 
spoke at the National Youth Workers Convention one year, stood up before 15,000 youth workers and said, you're about to hear the greatest sermon ever preached. Needless to say, there was an incredibly negative reaction to that. He simply opened the Bible and read word for word the Sermon on the Mount. And when he finished, he said, well, we'll all agree, that is the greatest sermon ever preached. And then he added, but then we thought he was only kidding. We're not going to take that seriously and sat down. That's a good question, isn't it? Are you going to take the Sermon on the Mount seriously? I think Ron Sider did a brilliant job of calling us to accountability. What does it mean to love your enemies? What does it mean to return good for evil? What does it mean to reject capital punishment? Because Jesus said it's no longer an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You're to love people. You're to overcome evil with good. What does it mean if you have two coats to give one away? What does it mean when Jesus says to the rich young ruler, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and take up the cross and follow me? One of these young men who came out of Eastern and is very, very committed to living out the red letters was dragged into my office, shoved into a chair. And his father started yelling at me saying, you got him into all of this. He's taking the red letters of the Bible seriously. He's out on the streets and he, he's giving away his money to pimps and whores. And he said, don't get me wrong, Campolo. I don't mind being Christian up to a point. I knew you would kind of snicker at that. But isn't it true of all of us? Aren't we all willing to be Christian up to a point? Why don't we change the hymn book? Up to a point, my Savior leads me. Up to a point, I gladly go. The real question is, was Dietrich Bonhoeffer right when he said when when Jesus calls us, he bids us come and die to go all the way with him. And so this father said, I don't mind being Christian up to a point. And the boy looked back at him and said, Dad, could that point be the cross? Oof. Oof. How does a sociologist look at this thing? Well, first of all, he sees two groups. Sociologists would say this, following Emil Durkheim. A group of people who, out of conflict, share an awareness of a common destiny is a group with a collective consciousness. We have two such groups represented at this conference, the Jewish people, the Palestinian people. Both are groups made up of people, each of which has a shared consciousness a shared collective consciousness. And the consciousness of each of those groups has been traumatized. We know about the Palestinian trauma. A group of people on the other side of the ocean, without asking them to come and be part of the discussion, decided that land that they thought was theirs would be taken from them and given to another group of people. They reacted with shock and amazement that this could happen. They were traumatized. And then people began showing up with pieces of paper, proving that this land wasn't just being taken from them, but had been bought. Here, we've got legal documentation that this land is ours. And in many cases, the land was purchased from absentee landlords living in Beirut, who they didn't even know existed. And the land was taken from them, and they were traumatized by all of that. And the word was given, this is a legal transaction. And of course, down deep inside, they knew that what is legal is not necessarily moral. If it was, then in fact, Martin Luther King would not have had to march. He, he marched and he led a civil rights movement because the laws of America which were legal, were not moral. What is legal is not necessarily moral. And so you have Palestinians who are traumatized. I mean, you've heard some of the stories this week of people whose homes were uh, demolished before their very eyes, of, of people who have been left out in the cold, who, who were left with nothing, who were, who were thrown aside. 
Here they all are a people with a collective consciousness. But it's a traumatized consciousness. Then there's the Jews. They too have been traumatized, and incredibly so. I mean, it's not just the Holocaust. It goes back for hundreds and hundreds of years. Everywhere they've gone, they've gotten the short end of the stick. It wasn't just the Holocaust. I mean, they were driven out of Spain. There were pogroms all over Europe. Every time they trusted people, they ended up being betrayed. And then, of course, there is the Holocaust itself. When Colin Chapman talked about his visit to Auschwitz, he didn't spell out the details. I didn't even ask him what the details were, but I know what hit him. He went into that one room where there's a pile of children's shoes, thousands and thousands of pairs of shoes in one huge pile, the children's shoes that were taken from boys and girls that were thrown into the ovens. When you see that, and if you're Jewish and identify with those children, the trauma is incredibly intense. And so you have two groups of people with a collective consciousness. Each group has been traumatized. Thus, each group is suffering from what social scientists would call post-traumatic syndrome. It's a psychological condition. If you've been traumatized as a group or as an individual, following that traumatic experience or experiences, you are constantly filled with fear and mistrust. And that's what we have on our hands. Two people who have been hurt, two groups of people who have experienced incredible pain, two groups of people who have been traumatized, and hence the reaction is fear and mistrust. If you're Palestinian, you're wondering, how much land will they take from us in the future? How many more settlements will be built? What will happen to us in the days that lie ahead? If you're Jewish, you're afraid. What does this Arab Spring really mean? I mean, we have this idea that there's going to be free elections, and therefore democracy will come. People hear me. Sociologists know something. Democracy is not where there's the right to vote and the majority rules. That's the common definition. A democracy is not where the majority rules. A democracy is where it's safe to be in the minority. Please understand that differentiation because it's crucial. Because they had a free election in Iraq. And when the dust cleared, the Shiites had won. And it's now unsafe to be either a Sunni or it's unsafe to be a Christian. We had 1,500,000 Christians in Iraq before the war. We're now down to about 600,000. And they've become refugees. It's not safe. Please note that at the outbreak of World War II, Jewish people in countries all over the Arab world suddenly were traumatized and fled because there was a sense that Hitler was going to defeat the Brits. And if the British Empire would fall apart, then the Arab peoples would be free. And thus, there was a great sympathy for Hitler. They didn't know about the Holocaust, but they were thrilled that somebody was going to do to Britain what Britain had done to them. Fear, mistrust. It became the order of the day. Now, if we have two groups that are suffering from post-traumatic syndrome, what is needed is a psychotherapist. And the real question I have is this one. Is the Palestinian church up to the challenge to be the therapist for both Muslim Palestinians on the one hand and for Jewish people on the other. Both these groups who are suffering from post-traumatic syndrome need to be healed. And insofar as the Palestinian church enters into the process of healing, of ministering to both groups, 
they will in fact themselves be healed. How do you do it? How do you handle this task of being a, an instrument of God, God's therapist to the Jews and to the Muslim Palestinians? We ourselves are wounded, you say, yes, and Henry Nouwen says, maybe that's to your credit because you can serve as the wounded healer. You can come with an empathy that no other group can come to, come with. You know what the Palestinian people have endured. Your empathy makes you an ideal psychoanalyst. Can the church fulfill that role? Is it willing to fulfill that role? To be empathetic. Empathy requires more than just listening. It's entering into the other person. I remember when I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. I had a large class, 1,500 students in my introduction to sociology class, met in Irvine Auditorium. After class, I went to my office. A student came up and asked a rather perfunctory question about George Searle, a great German sociologist. I answered it as best I could. I answered the question in a perfunctory manner. I said, is there anything else? He sat there for a long moment. Then he said, no. And he got up and left. I didn't think much about it for a while until someone told me a few hours later that 20 minutes after he had been with me, he went to the top of the apartment building where he lived and jumped to his death. And I know what I did wrong. I listened to what he had to say. And I needed to do much more than that. I had to feel what was coming over and under and around his words. I had to enter into what Buber would have called an I, thou, and relationship in which I felt my way into his soul. Now, that's difficult to do. And that's why we have to take seriously being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit that en enables us to connect in depth with the person who we are listening to. I wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When I was in high school, there was this girl who was really alive in Christ. She was Pentecostal. I'm not Pentecostal. I don't speak in tongues. I don't even kiss in tongues. <laughs> oh. she, was, she was a vibrant young woman. Oh, so alive, so, so electric with the dynamism of God. I wondered what she had, so one Sunday night I went to her church. And the minister called everybody forward and we all went forward and wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit and this guy went down, he was terrific. He hit people on the head and everybody he hit fell over, unconscious, except me. He hit me and nothing happened. He moved on and knocked over a few other people. Then he came back and hit me again. I remember how disappointed I was when I went home that night because I wanted to be filled with the Spirit. Strangely, it was a Roman Catholic that helped me along the way. He introduced me to the writings of St. Ignatius. And I began to learn other ways of praying. I always prayed Baptist. And if you're Presbyterian, don't get uppity. You don't do it any better than we do it. You read off a list of non-negotiables to the Almighty. You're like my son when he was seven years old, coming into the living room and saying, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? And I had to learn other ways of praying, and my Catholic friend taught me other ways of praying. One of the ways I pray these days is to wake up in the morning and to be absolutely still, to center down on Jesus, the old African-American spiritual. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Or the one song that we old people know, 
You know, we don't know all these new worship songs that you're into. If, if I get to heaven and they have an overhead projector, I'm checking out, I gotta tell you. <laughs> but if you're, if you're as old as Monfred, you know this song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Sing it with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. It takes me at least 15 minutes to drive back all the animals, as C.S. Lewis called them. All of those extemp extraordinary things that come in to capture your consciousness and, and, and get your head spinning when you wake up in the morning. I have to drive them back and create what the Celtic Christians called the thin place, where the wall between God and the individual becomes so thin that the spirit can break through, envelop, invade, and possess. It takes me a long time become still, become inwardly still, and not ask God for anything. They asked Mother Teresa once, when you pray, what do you say to God? She said, I don't say anything, I listen. So the interviewer said, oh, oh, oh right. When you pray, what does God say to you? She said, God doesn't say anything, God listens. And if you don't understand that, I can't explain it to you. I do understand that. I do understand a kind of praying where you say nothing and you hear nothing, but in quietude and the stillness, you center down on Christ and you wait patiently for the spirit to flow in and to envelop you and penetrate you and saturate you with his or her presence. To surrender to the spirit only those who are spiritually energized can enter empathetically as Christ would have us enter empathetically into the mindset of the other. It will be easier for you who are Palestinian to empathize with your Muslim, your Muslim Palestinian friends, but it'll be harder to do it for the Jewish people and with the Jewish people to feel their fears, their fears about the Arab Spring, wondering whether they're going to be surrounded by countries that previously were at peace with them. What will happen with Egypt? What will happen with Jordan? What will, what will happen with Syria? Will, will there come to the surface people who, who, because of what they have seen happen over the years, are anxious to destroy the state of Israel? to empathize with those fears, not just to intellectually understand them, but to, to feel them. And, and, and here's a little nation that has survived primarily because of the wealth and the war material supplied by the US government. And they're watching the United States go into rapid decline. And they're wondering, will the United States be there for us 10 years from now? Will they be our flying buttress that will keep us firmly in place, or will we be completely on our own? These are good questions. Eric Fromm, one of the disciples of Sigmund Freud, wrote a book on fascism called Escape from Freedom. And in it, he depicted what he felt most frightened him about Christians and specifically evangelical Christians that we have a tendency to define people who aren't Christians as, here it comes, totally depraved. Now there's an interesting concept, totally depraved. Once you define a group of people as totally depraved, there's, there's anything you can do. I mean, you can throw them into an oven. What's wrong with throwing a six million totally depraved, demonically possessed people into an oven? What's wrong with it? Unless you can sense the God that you love in that person. Unless you can believe that the same Christ who died on Calvary is alive 
and chooses to come at you through the person you have deemed the enemy. Unless you can look into your enemy's eyes and feel Jesus staring back at you. You will not be able to treat that person as Christ would have us treat one another. You say, are you really attacking the doctrine of total depravity? If in fact you're saying that the image of God is totally obliterated in the person who isn't a Christian, I say, yes I am. I see the sacredness in every human being. And if there is a sacred presence there, then there is something of God in that person waiting to be encountered. And I believe, and actually was put on heresy trial this, that whenever you look into the lives and into the eyes of the lost and the last and the least, you're connecting with Jesus. That is if you're filled with the Spirit. I think the Spirit equips us to enter into the sacredness of the other. To empathize. To empathize. I remember the play by Lorraine Hansberry, Raisin in the Sun. In the story, in the play, a family that lives in, in Chicago, an African-American family, experiences the death of the father. The good news is that the, he leaves behind a small legacy of $10,000. Bernitha, the daughter, wants the money to go to medical school. The mother wants the money to buy a house in the suburbs with flower beds. But the young man says, I've never had a chance. I have a friend and we can go into business together. With that money, we can make a lot of money. And there'll be enough for Bernitha to go to medical school and enough for mom to have that house with the flower beds. Against her better judgment, the mother gives the money to the young man. Needless to say, his so-called friend is not a friend. He skips town with the money and he has to come home broken and shattered and dispirited. And he has to confess that he's been the fool. Beneath the tears into him with a string of epithets and horrible names. And as she's screaming and yelling, the mother interrupts and says, I thought I taught you to love him. Bernitha says, love him? There's nothing left to love. And the mother speaks. There's always something left to love. And if you ain't learned that, honey, you ain't learned nothing. When do you think it's time to love somebody? When he's done you good and made things better for you? You think that's the time to love him? That's not the time at all. The time to love somebody is when he's at his lowest and the world has done whipped him so. Empathy. Caring. If you're going to be a good psychotherapist, you not only have to be an empathizer, you have to be a reconciler. When I was a kid, I had this idea that if you came to the altar and gave your life to Christ, that you would then go out and be friends with everybody in the world. My pastor made it clear before he, because I was a social activist guy, before you can start getting right with people out there in the world, you've got to get right with God. made sense to me until I read the Bible, until I read the red letters. The red letters said, listen here, it said, you can't do it that way. You have to, you have to get reconciled to your brother first and then come to the altar. Remember that passage? If you come to the altar, and, and you're not ready to connect with your brother out there in the world, forget this altar stuff. Too often it's 20 verses of just as I am, you come down just as you are and go out just as you were. <laughs> they try to tell us we gotta be reconciled to Jesus first. Many of us know John Perkins. One of the world's most famous evangelists came to Jackson, Mississippi for a crusade. And the evangelist called all the preachers in the city together. And John, who speaks in that Southern African-American manner of slowness, disarms you because you don't think he's very smart. <coughs> and he's brilliant. 
And at one point he stood up and he said, uh, now, what do you want to see happen here in Jackson, Mississippi? And the evangelist said, I want to see everybody have a born again experience. John said, well, that, that's, that's interesting, preacher. He said, you know, but when I was knee high in a grasshopper, people have spat on me and humiliated me and hurt me, treated me as subhuman. People have done that ever since I was a little boy. And you know, in almost every case, that person said he was a born again Christian. And now you want all of Jackson to be born again? <laughs> it's so easy to have this relationship with Jesus without a relationship to your brother. But Jesus ties them up together, doesn't he? In those red letters, he says, you want to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Then you'd better love your neighbor as yourself because it's the same thing. Because the God you want to love comes to you sacramentally through the poor and the oppressed. That's an interesting phrase. It comes from the Franciscans. Sacramentally through the poor and the oppressed. Sacramentally. The Catholics, you know, they have in Holy Communion the sacrament, the, the Eucharist, the the, the bread becomes literally the flesh of Jesus and the wine literally the blood of Christ. At the other end of the line, are we Baptists? We believe that in Holy Communion, the bread stays bread and the wine is turned into grape juice. That's what Baptists believe. In the middle of the Episcopalians and the Lutherans, they say it's still bread, it's still wine, but Somehow, in a mystical way, the presence of Christ infuses the elements, and he's there. He's there. In a real sense, that's what I'm talking about. We've got to enter into those reconciling relationships. I saw this happen in Northern Ireland. Prior to the peace talks, there was a man in Northern Ireland who was bringing Catholics and Protestants together, and he invited me to speak at a peace rally in Portadown, just before the Protestants would obscenely march through the Catholic neighborhood, calling the Catholics all kinds of terrible names and those terrible marches they have there. When I walked into the room, to my surprise, the Protestants were sitting on one side of the room with facing into the center, and the Catholics were on folding chairs on the other side of the room looking into the center. I thought, whoa, we're off to a great reconciliation here. The program started with a Protestant standing up and saying, I always hated Pro Catholics, and I want to tell you some of the terrible things I've done. And looked across the room and said, will you, in the name of Jesus, forgive me? And the Catholics said, in the name of Christ, we forgive you. Then a Catholic man stood up and said almost the identical thing. I've done terrible things to Protestants. Uh, and he, he named the things that he had done. And he said, will you forgive me? And the Protestants in one voice said, in the name of Jesus, we forgive you. And they went back and forth and back and forth until they got to the end. And here was a guy in a wheelchair with no legs. And he said, I always hated Protestants. But one day I went and got in my car and turned on the ignition and a bomb went off and blew off both my legs. And then I hated Protestants with a passion. But my priest prayed with me, and I felt Christ come into my life. And I have forgiven the man who did this to me. And the Protestant man on the other side stood up and said, he did. I'm the one who set the bomb. And the man in the wheelchair said, and what he hasn't told you is I have no children. I only had my wife. And when she died nine months ago, he invited me to live with him, and we are living together as brothers in Christ. Reconciliation comes with confession, and we really need confession, don't we? Both sides need to repent. Earlier this week, I had a meeting with the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and we sat down and talked with each other. And at the end of our discussion, he offered this option. Will you tell the people at Bethlehem Bible College, will you tell your evangelical friends that we need to talk? If you could get a group of them together 
to meet with a group of rabbis that I can get together. We can begin the conversation. And so the challenge will be there and I'm going to write to you and give you his name and phone number and if you don't call, terrible things will happen to you. Do you understand? <laughs> But when you do get together, the last thing you should do is try to point out the faults of the other side. When you get together, the conversation must begin by you confessing your own faults because you dare not look for the splinter in your brother's eye until you've gotten rid of the beam in your own eye. Amen? Amen. You gotta do that. You say, but we, we're the innocent ones. Here's what I've learned as a sociologist. When there's a broken relationship, only the innocent know how to ask for forgiveness. And only the guilty need it. You say it's an impossible situation, it's an impasse. No, it's not. It is not an impasse if the innocent are willing to, res in willing to assume the responsibility for what has happened. You say, wait a minute, are you asking those of us who are victims, who are innocent, to assume the guilt? Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? Isn't it true that he who never sinned on the cross became sin for our sakes? Is not Calvary about the innocent assuming the guilt of the guilty and making it his own? We need to do this. I was thrilled when I heard that the Wheaton students had gone out in the streets and were partying and dancing with, with Palestinians. I wonder what they'll do back at Wheaton when they find that their students were dancing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when my church, my pastor would always say, dancing stimulates the lust of the flesh. And I would always go on, yeah, that's how, yeah. <laughs> of course it does, amen? Right? I mean, if you can stand in front of a woman vibrating like that for three hours and not get turned on, you're not spiritual, you're dead. <laughs> but what is necessary is not just to dance and sing and party with Palestinian young people, but to go through the checkpoint and sing and dance with Jewish young people and eventually bring Jewish young people and Palestinians together to party together. Whenever Jesus is describing the kingdom of God, it's always in terms of a party. My kingdom, he said, is like unto do a wedding feast. Jesus was Jewish, which is the next best thing to being Italian. <laughs> people often say to me, if Italian's so wonderful, why didn't Jesus come as an Italian? because he came to humble himself. <laughs> but Jews, Jews, Italians, Arab people, we have something in common. We know how to have a wedding feast. If you've ever been to an Italian wedding, you know that. You don't even have to go to an Italian wedding. You can go to an Italian funeral. The only difference between an Italian wedding and an Italian funeral is there's one less person at the Italian funeral. That's all. <laughs> when Jesus describes it, he describes the kingdom of God as a wedding feast, the ultimate party in the ancient Hebraic world. So the next time they ask you what time is it, you're going to yell back what? It's... That's good. That's good. When Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, and Jesus is marching down Wayne's Main Street, and everybody's pushing him back, he climbs up in the sycamore tree. Remember this from Daily Vacation Bible School? For he wanted his Lord to see, and at last the Savior came. Walking by, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you're a dirty, filthy sinner, and you're gonna burn in hell forever. <laughs> That's not what he said. He yelled, yo, Zach, come on down. We're going to go to your house today. We're going to have a party. Then there's the story of the prodigal son, same thing. He takes half of his father's money and goes off to some evil city like London. 
and waste his father's money in riotous living. And when he's feeding the pigs, he would like to eat the slop that the pigs are eating. And he says, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll go home and ask my father for a job. Now, if you're going to go home after you've blown half of your father's wealth, you'd better prepare your speech. And he does. I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me all the way home. He's going up. Father, I'm so Father sees him when he's a long way off. Remember the story. He runs out, throws his arms around, and the kid starts the speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven. Father's not listening. Harry, get a robe. This kid's in rags. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Bill, get a ring. Put it on his finger. I, would you make me shut up, kid? <laughs> Bill, out behind the barn, is a fat calf. Kill that sucker. We're going to have a party. What time is it? It's party time. Oh, we need to learn not just to confess our sins and shed the tears that come with confession, even as we assume the guilt for what has happened. We need to get together with people across the other side of the checkpoint and learn to party with them. I would hope that young Palestinian Christian young people will go to those young soldiers that I saw at the checkpoint with their machine guns and say, hey, is it possible for either us to come to your side or you come to our side? We'd like to have a party with you some night. We'd like to, we'd like to spend some money in, and we'd like to bring you together in celebration. Will you let us do that? I don't know whether it's possible, but if it's possible, make it, make it happen. And then this. Lastly, if you're going to be the therapist of God, you not only have to be empathetic, you not only have to be in reconciling work, but you have to be prophetic. Prophetic. Walter Brueggemann, in his book, The, the Prophetic Imagination, says the prophet has two characteristics. First, the prophet weeps. Weeps for what his own people have done wrong weeps over what is happening to his own people. Palestinian Christians have to weep at what the Palestinians have done to the Israelis. We Americans, and there's a lot of us here, have to weep about what we've done to both the Palestinians and the Israelis. I mean, we know that we have created most of the problems over here. I mean, that war in Iraq, that has stirred such hatred against America. What do you think it was about? I'm here to tell you this, that if mushrooms instead of oil had been the major export, we would have never invaded the country. We need to repent. Palestinians need to repent. You say, what about the Israelis? Let repentance start with us. They will respond when they see the tears in our eyes. And so the challenge is there. But we also have to come up with an alternative vision of the future. One of the earlier speakers said that, an alternative vision of the future. Last time I was here, I laid one out. It's not mine. It comes from... Uh, comes from uh, Russell Neely of political science department at Princeton University. He said, why don't they try this? Two states, both with their capital in Jerusalem. All people of Arab descent will have to belong to the Palestinian state, which means that, and here's the rub, here's the problem. Israeli Palestinians will have to give up their citizenship to form this new state. All people of Jewish descent will have to belong to the Jewish state. And then this, people can live everywhere and anywhere they want. The Arabs can return. The reason why they're not allowed to return is because the Jews are scared to death at what? That they'll outnumber the, the Jews and vote Israel out of existence. But of course, if they can live anywhere, 
But no matter where you live, you're a citizen of the Palestinian state, you won't be able to vote them out of existence, no matter where you live. No, will you have to, in fact, turn down, tear down the settlements. You say, what about the people who lost their land? I think the United Nations that created this problem has to put up money called reparations to the Palestinians who have lost their land. They created the problem. They need to put up money so that land can be purchased back. Then Jews and Christians who are Palestinian and Muslim Palestinians can live together. Integrated society. It's called the condominium solution. They're living together, but, but they belong to two separate states. I think the person who said we need to come together and, and, and become friends with each other and get to know each other and get these walls going was absolutely right. But this is a way of doing it. I ran it by the consulate in Philadelphia. He thought it was workable. A week before I came here, I spent an hour and a half with President Clinton and ran it by him. And he looked at that and he looked at his own Clinton plan. And he said, I think this is workable. I think it's workable. But if we can do it, if we can come up with this vision of the future that is workable, for the, for the prophet not only weeps over what's happened to his people or her people, but also offers an alternative vision of the future and a workable means of achieving that vision, then there is hope for the future. I pray that it will happen. I pray that I pray that things can change. I belong to a black church and with this I close. Once a year in our church we have Student Recognition Day. It's a wonderful day in the life of our church. People go crazy on that day. I mean, we love it. The pastor doesn't even have to have a good sermon because we're all so happy. I preached at it and I wasn't very good the day I preached. And some lady in the back, halfway through my sermon, yelled, Help him, Jesus! Help him, Jesus! <laughs> About 50 students sitting on the first few rows, one by one, comes to the rostrum. Only says his name or her name, where that person is going to school and what's being studied. I'm... I'm studying law at Harvard. And you hear grandmothers and grandfathers go, my, my, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Somebody else will say, I'm studying engineering at MIT. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody else will say, I'm studying, I'm studying music at Juilliard. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You've heard some great music here this week. But you haven't heard the greatest music. So you hear about 500 grandmothers and grandfathers moaning and groaning the moans and groans of joy because their children are becoming what they never thought they could become. Their children are becoming what America never let them be. You know what I mean by that. And when they were all seated, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, my pastor got up and looked at them. He said, children, he talks like that. Children, he said, you're going to die. You're going to die. That's a good thing to tell kids. Because they don't think they're going to die. That's why they drive the way they do. He said, you don't think you're going to die, but you're going to die. They're going to take you out to the cemetery. They're going to drop you in a hole. They're going to throw dirt in your face. And they're going to go back to the church and eat potato salad. He said, when you were born, you were the only one that cried. Everybody else was happy. So live that when you die, you will be the only one that's happy and everybody else will cry. And that depends on what you're striving for. Are you striving for titles or testimonies? See, that's black preaching. It's got rhythm, alliteration. Titles or testimonies? White guys can't do that. And then he did what only a black preacher can do. He swept through the Bible in five minutes. You know white preachers. We can't do that. We get bogged down. Today we're going to exegete the third verse of the second chapter. He started in Genesis and went through Revelation. He said there was Moses and there was Pharaoh. Pharaoh had the title, ruler of Egypt. That's a good title. But when it was over, that's all he had was a title. 
He had the title, but Moses had testimonies. There's Jezebel. Queen Jezebel, another good title. Queen Jezebel. She was going to destroy Elijah the prophet of God, but when it was over, all she had was a title. She had the title, but Elijah had the... You're getting into it. We're going to de you. I will give you just one more shot. There's, there's King Darius. Good title, king. He was going to throw Daniel into the lion's den, but when it was over, all Darius had was a title. He had the title, but Daniel had the... So be reconcilers, empathizers, prophets. Be the therapy that Jewish people need across the checkpoint. Be the therapy that Palestinian Muslims need on this side of the checkpoint. And when it's over and they drop you in the hole and throw the dirt in your face, there'll be people, Palestinians and Jews together, giving testimonies, testimonies of how you were the instrument of God that became the means that brought us together. May this be your calling. You are a unique people, such a small people. But God has been able to do great things through small groups of people. I wish for you both titles and testimonies. But if you gotta take a choice, go for the testimonies. <laughs>